Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and this is Chapter 4 of the Story of Art by Ernst Gombrich. These are the sound annotated lecture slides. In Chapter 4, we're going to be looking at Greece, late Grecian history, 500 BC to about 100 BC, and there's a lot of supplementary images that exist in this set of slides also. First of all, let's take a look at a Greek temple. This is called a Doric temple, primarily because of this thing here at the top of the columns. This sort of a thing here called the capital of the columns. More importantly, as far as the entire temple goes, we have here columns supporting this big member which supports this triangular roof. And we even see some decoration in this area and some decorations on top. The proportions of the width to the spacing of the columns seems to produce an elegant sort of an effect. The columns here are narrower than they are here, and there's almost like a bulge in the middle. So it seems like these columns are kind of pushing out a little bit against the weight, almost in an organic way. In designing a temple like this, the Greeks came up with an idea for a very dignified structure that has persisted through the ages. We're going to see that there's a few differences in different types of temples, primarily based on this top to the column called a capital. And in subsequent illustrations, you're going to see names for these various features of the temple. We'll also talk about why this is a Doric temple based on that type of a column. There are two other types of columns distinguished by the type of capital, and we'll see examples of those too. Here's another thing that you don't see usually in illustrations of Greek temples. Polychrome decoration, that means many color decoration. Here, for example, is the way we think a column capital was decorated. And this part of the temple under the roof here, this sloping roof, under it, this is called a frieze. And there are two parts to it. There's the metopes and there's the triglyphs. Triglyphs here, metopes here. We see these temples all in stark white. But actually, the Greeks didn't see them that way. They painted them a variety of very bright colors to, to paint flesh tones on the bodies, and things like these triglyphs, perhaps in blue, and these designs on what looks like a plain part of the capital to us probably looked rather colorful to the Greeks who saw these in the this late Greek era. Now, the types of paints they used probably were water-based, might have had some other types of mixture in, such as gum arabic, to make them sticky. But the fact that the temples we see these days don't have any of this paint on them pretty clearly indicates that the paint that was once there has worn off with age and with weathering. Here's another example. This is a decoration in the area of the frieze of a Greek temple. And here we see what some people think might have been the types of decorations on that triangular sloping roof of the temple, but here we see an archer and decorated in all sorts of ways that just seem rather strange to us because we're used to looking at statues like this entirely in white, which would have seemed unfinished to the Greeks of the ancient period. Here you can even see that what we see here as kind of colorfully knit pants and here in just a straight cuff, and the straight cuff really is here. It's not as if this is a bare leg, but we don't see anything except the very bare hints of some color that remain on statues like this. And here's another view of the very same thing in a museum exhibit that has just a silhouette out here of some other figure behind this one, but here's what we think it might have been decorated like at the time that the Greeks constructed these. And of course, because the paint would wear off, it would have to be maintained. It would have to be repainted from time to time in order to keep its brilliance. Here is a frieze, as we see it today, with some traces of this polychrome effect, just hints of colors that were at one time there. Here's how the Greeks would have seen it. Quite possibly it would have been colored like this. Very, very vivid. And not only does it stand out from the wall because of the way it's been carved, but the fact that it's colorful makes it all the more dramatic. And this wartime scene here of somebody fending off a blow from somebody else, perhaps there's supposedly a knife in this person's hand, and maybe there's a weapon in this person's hand too, him 
going to stab this poor unfortunate soul down here and this soldier stabbing this person. So an awful lot of drama going on here. We can see the same sort of thing here, but once again, it's incorrect to think that this white type of illustration is the way the Greeks would have seen it. This is one of a couple of illustrations that indicate to you the names for these various parts of the temple. I'm not going to require you to know all these, but some of the major parts. For example, here on the frieze area, you should realize that this flat area where there are usually figures is called metopes, and this vertical three bars is a triglyph. Tri meaning three, of course. The pediment is this area under the roof, but the tympanum is the decoration within there. And here you can see the pediment has no decoration. It has no tympanum. This is the case in a very famous building in Rome called the Pantheon, where it did originally, when constructed by the Romans along the Greek design, have a decoration here, but it was made of bronze and it was later melted down and actually used for part of St. Peter's Basilica. Here we have the capital and the column, the area of the steps leading up to the temple. The architrave is this flat piece here immediately above the columns. And of course this area here is the frieze. Let's take a look at another illustration. Here this doesn't add too much that's very important except to show you of course that the cornice, this area of the roof, the frieze, and the architrave all make up what is called the entablature. The column is divided into the capital and then the shaft of the column. You might see the capital itself picked apart with these three parts to it, but it's nothing that we're going to worry about that level of detail here. And this stylobate is just the area immediately under the columns. Now one other thing that's kind of important because it sort of stands out is the acroteria. These things are the decorations at the top, the end of the temple roof, sometimes at the top, the other side of the temple roof, these decorations called acroteria in one shape or another. And here's yet again another illustration that just reiterates what the previous illustration did, except here we have a different type of a column. Here we have what's known as an ionic column. And the difference here, ionic, you'll notice that instead of, as in this previous illustration, having a flat pad here, as in the case of a Doric column, what we see here is some scroll work. So an ionic column is a little bit fancier. There is a third type of a column called a Corinthian that's even much more decorated up here at the top, and you'll see in just a second. Here we see the tympanum actually is present, these figures decorating the temple, but here the frieze area here doesn't have really much decoration at all. Now this illustration from the story of art, the Erechtheion, on the Acropolis, which is the major hill on which the Parthenon, the larger temple, is constructed. And here we see ionic columns. Once again, they're ionic because of the shape of the capital. And this is a summary of the three different orders of Greek columns, orders being just the three different types of capitals. So summing things up, the Doric, just a flat pad, the ionic, this type of a scroll work, and this Corinthian, very florid sort of flourishes up here of all sorts of shapes. Now, these three examples all come from Chicago. There are various bank buildings in Chicago, and here's Union Station with these Corinthian columns. A building that attempts to look dignified will, will often use this type of a decoration or structural member. In some cases, it really doesn't serve a purpose except as decoration. I, I strongly suspect that this column here at Union Station is purely decorative. The structure would hold up without it. In other cases, perhaps the column does serve a structural purpose. But the main reason for the columns being there is to lend dignity to the building 